hear from Peter Pontos, who is uh, a Greek Canadian living here for the last uh, for the last while since he jumped uh, ship from the U.S. Marines as a war resistor. Um, he teaches political science at uh, Langara University. Um, he's been involved in uh, in social justice activism and lots of other things for for years, and he's going to draw some links for us between the crisis in Greece and the crisis here and give us a bit of a history of where this is coming from in terms of Greek, Greece's recent history, um, particularly the post-war period. So I'll give it over to Peter. Thank you. And again, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm lucky in that uh, Ingo covered a lot of the material that provides sort of a background, uh, the bigger picture, because one of the things to keep in mind whether we're talking about Greece or Canada or Nicaragua or whatever, is that um, what happens in particular countries isn't just the result of what those countries do. We have a global system. And I want to sp speak in some particular ways about how the global system has affected Greece. Now, to begin with, uh, Greece won its independence in revolt from the Ottoman Empire back in the 1820s. When we did get our independence, the great powers at the time, which were Britain, France, and Russia, uh, essentially established a form of colonialism. They did not want, uh, you know, the, they didn't appreciate the idea of little countries having independence. So they decided that they would force Greece to have a king, uh, not a Greek king, but actually a 17-year-old prince from Bavaria was made the king of Greece. He didn't speak Greek, uh, and he was given uh, essentially dictatorial powers, as you would expect from a monarch, all to keep uh, Greece in its place to do the bidding of, of these larger powers. After a while, Britain became the dominant influence in Greece in, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And one thing that's important to keep in mind is when the Second World War had broken out, uh, you had Mussolini, who was essentially jealous of Hitler because Hitler was, had been conquering so many countries. So uh, he gave Greece an ultimatum, essentially let, let my troops occupy your country or else. The Greek response essentially was, oh, he, no. And uh, the, the, Greek, uh, the Greek army was able to inflict the first military defeat ever upon the fascist forces uh, in the Second World War. And one thing that I think is particularly interesting in that context was a few years later, um, the British Foreign Secretary in 1946 said that I would like to stress the fact that without accepting either the Soviet Union or Great Britain or the US, no country fought in World War II with greater bravery than Greece. And he added, we must not allow ourselves to forget this today. Later on, Churchill made the same point, that we must uh, show our gratitude to Greece and how we respect her in the years to come. But of course, that's not what happened. <laughs> Not surprisingly. For instance, uh, there, the main resistance to fascism in Greece in the Second World War was left wing. And that had, they had popular support. But they were not allowed to come into power in a democratic means. In fact, the British imposed the government in, beginning in 1944, which kicked off a civil war, lasted about five years, and uh, in which hundreds of thousands of people were, were victims. Um, when the Brits could not continue in 1947 because their empire was starting to fall apart, the new empire, the United States, took over. This was when uh, Harry Truman announced the so-called Truman Doctrine, saying that the U.S. would fight communism everywhere and so on. And the U.S. Uh, began the, uh, the financing and military support for the right-wing Greek government, which by 1949 had, had conquered. So. Greece has always been seen in the modern era as essentially a puppet or potential puppet of one empire or another. When we're looking at Greece in the present crisis, however, I want to go back a little bit uh, in terms of what led up to it. And one of the biggest problems, and you see this all the time, you saw this as, as Ingo was saying in, in regards to poor people in the US who bought homes that, that they eventually lost, was every time there's a crisis in capitalism, the, the elites, the media, and so on, blame the people. You know, it's these poor, it's these lazy people, you know, uh, and so on. And while the, while the situation in, in, uh, in Greece has obviously had a lot of complex uh, sources, what I'm arguing is the Greek people themselves are not responsible for the crisis or for the debt. Again, it must be seen in these, in these global um, 
in this global perspective. Now, obviously, again, as Inga was pointing out, the Greek elites, the political and economic elites, the multimillionaires and the billionaires working with the economic elites in, in, in Europe and eventually the European Union, of course, they were essentially feathering their own nests at the expense of uh, the future uh, economic stability and prosperity of Greece. Um, and there, there's so many other actors to mention here, but for example, when Greece wanted to join uh, the Euro in 2002, uh, and, and, the, and the, it had been part of the European Union before, obviously, um, it was none other than Goldman Sachs, one of the biggest financial players in the world, which cooked the Greek books to allow Greece to actually take part in, the, in these enterprises. Um, you know, you rarely hear about that, but Goldman Sachs made, made a lot of money by essentially circumventing the, uh, the rules in the European Union. Um, what, one of the biggest problems, and, and keep coming back to this, is when Greece adopted the euro, while there were some benefits, essentially it meant it lost control of its economy. Okay, it was, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention some examples in a minute. Uh, but in other words, it became more of a puppet of international players. Uh, Greg Palast, who's an author some of you may have read, said, uh, slightly exaggerating, he said, quote, the euro is simply the Deutschmark with little stars on it. <laughs> he went on to say that he wrote this about a month ago, Greece cannot adopt Germany's currency without adopting Germany's finance minister, Wolfgang Schauble, as its own. And Schauble has determined that Greece must, must be punished. And this is another thing, and again, partly goes back to having a larger perspective. On the one hand, uh, as Ingo pointed out, what the elites do fear is not just Greece, but Greeks, Italians, uh, the French, the Spanish, like Podemos, which is the, the rising party in Spain now, and even you know in, in other other European countries, coming together, realizing that they have a, they have common problems and and possibly common solutions, because you know Greece is only about two or three percent of the European uh, economy, they they could fix the problem, the, the the troika could fix it without any any economic issues at all. But they, want it, they don't want to set an example, a bad example from their point of view. The other aspect, and this is, uh, I'm quoting from Mark Weisbrot, who's, who's uh, an economist at the, in Washington for the Center for Economic and Policy uh, Research, I think a very credible person, and he says that essentially um, what the uh, European Troika is doing is blackmailing Greece. The, the European Central Bank and its European partners have become, it's become increasingly clear they're trying to harm the Greek economy in order to increase pressure on the new Greek government to agree to their demands. So it's like, if you don't follow your orders, we will destroy your economy, and it doesn't matter how the people suffer. Um, and again, the suffering, I'm sure many of you uh, have some idea of, uh, of, of what's going on, but we're talking about unemployment of around 25%, uh, youth unemployment of around 50 or 60% now, and hundreds of thousands of young Greeks have had to leave Greece and go to Spain, go to France, go to Germany, come to Canada to try and make a living. Uh, and again, what I want to stress is this has nothing to do with some alleged defect in Greek people or whatever. Uh, for example, there was an article in um, uh, The Guardian a couple of years ago by a British economist, Ha Jun Chang. And what, what he pointed out was if you look at the actual statistics, it's not at all that, that Greeks or Italians or Spaniards are lazy. But he points out you ha when, when you, you traumatize a country, you have to blame the victims. It's their fault. Again, they're lazy, they're stupid, they don't make good investments or whatever. And one point he makes is, he, and this is in general, he says, moreover, poorer people typically work harder than the rich. They usually work in jobs with longer hours and tougher working conditions. Except for a tiny, tiny minority, they are poor, uh, despite the welfare state, not because they're given so many uh, uh, you know, disincentives to work. And then he points out, and this is from 1911, that if you look at the OECD figures, these are the 34 most developed countries in the world. Outside of South Korea, the workers who put in the most hours per week are Greeks. Um, on average, Greeks put in over 2,000 hours in 2011, in the same year, Germans only worked 70% as many hours. So, I mean, right away, it's, it's important to keep that in mind, that 
sure, again, there was corruption in Greece, as if there isn't in, in other countries. Of course, there are elites who put themselves ahead of everyone else. But in order to justify the kind of policies, again, it's not just unemployment, which is bad enough, cuts to health care. People, uh, people are starving. People are killing themselves in rates never seen before. Um, there's despair, as you can imagine. Uh, it's, 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 it's impossible to get away with this kind of uh, uh, atrocity unless you can somehow say, well, these people deserve it. You know, it's, it's their fault. There's another problem which you almost never hear about in the mainstream media, that partly because of things like global warming, which is real, by the way, uh, partly because of the U.S. wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now all over, all over the Middle East, Greece has been flooded with desperate refugees from these countries. Hundreds of thousands of poor people trying to get away from war and starvation pass through Greece, or sometimes they don't pass through. A lot of them are still there. The European Union, uh, the, the United Nations, so on, essentially doing nothing to help those people. But that's another burden that the Greek economy is struggling to deal, struggling to deal with, again, which Greece didn't create. Greece didn't say, let's go uh, attack Iraq. In fact, as far as I know, when the U.S. attacked Iraq in, uh, under, under George Bush II, uh, Greece was the only country where the workers went on strike for a day in protest uh, for that particular form of, uh, of warmongering. And so, again, that's a bad example, you know. The other thing to keep in mind is when it comes to the so-called debt, what's essentially happened, and of course I'm oversimplifying and overgeneralizing, but essentially you've got uh, foreign investors, uh, as Ingo was saying, French banks, German banks, individuals, uh, who are saying, hmm, the Greek economy is, is not doing well, so their bonds uh, are paying a high interest rate because the risk is high. So we will, we will take a chance. We'll buy these bonds to make a lot of money. But they know that if there's an economic problem, if this is a downturn, they know that the Greek people will be forced uh, to, to pay back their bad investments because for every bad uh, borrower, there's a, there's a bad lender, essentially. Now, it's sometimes in this case, it's called austerity. For decades, in regards to the same policies being imposed in Latin America, in Asia and Africa, it was called structural adjustment. And in both cases, the International Monetary Fund had a huge role there. So uh, Chomsky uses a term actually that he got from the US government, uh, referring to this as odious debt. When there's a debt that's imposed upon a people that they haven't in any democratic way arranged for, that they don't benefit from, and yet they're supposed to pay off the investors who tried, who was planning to make money off of, off of the high interest rates on the bonds or whatever. Uh, and again, this term comes from the U.S. Uh, 100 years ago. That, and the U.S. even said, people are not obliged to repay an odious debt. Well, I'm arguing that's what happened uh, to Greece. Again, that's what happened in Mexico. This is what happened in um, South Korea. So many other examples. Me uh, Mexico, where um, when the investors are running into trouble, they, they use the IMF or the United States government or whatever to pressure uh, local governments to squeeze the, the people to pay back the rich speculators, which of course increases more inequality, poverty, and so on. So it was called structural adjustment when it was applied to the so-called third world. Now it's austerity in Greece. And again, these are global issues, but always <laughs> ask yourself who benefits. And it's not the people of these countries. You know, It's obviously the, the various national and international elites. Now apparently time keeps speeding up, so I'm going to have to make this, this kind of quick here. Trust me, I could go on. Um, let's see. In addition, The Guardian reported a couple of years ago that the International Monetary Fund admitted that they made a huge mistake when they imposed austerity on Greece. Uh, and Paul Krugman, some of you know, is a Nobel Prize winning economist. He writes for the New York Times. He's not a Marxist, that's his problem, but he's a smart guy. <laughs> And uh, what he says, and again, I can quote here uh, from, from other sort of mainstream economists and so on, but that if you want to revive an economy like in Greece, the last thing you do is put in, you know, destroy trade unions, cut back on, on things like a social uh, security net, on health care and so on. What you do is basic Keynesianism like the U.S. and Canada did in the Second World War, and even 
And, and these policies, again, they're not that radical. Obama has come out in favor of this kind of policy. Mark Carney, who used to be the governor of the Bank of Canada and did so well that he's now the governor of the Bank of England, said that, quote, the Eurozone needs to ease its hardline budgetary policies and make rapid progress towards a fiscal union that would transfer resources from rich to poor countries. Um, quote, since the financial crisis, all major advanced economies have been in a debt trap where low growth deepens the burden of debt. In other words, what the EU needs to do, and I would argue that we should do here, but it's not going to happen as long as the Harpertron's in charge, we, we need to put money into people, into creating jobs, you know, it's obvious, green jobs, put money into health care and so on, rev up the economy. Again, it turned things around in the Second World War, but the opposite policy is being pursued now in Greece. What you have is a situation, just to wrap up, where we finally have a government in Greece which just says, it says, oh, enough is enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. It's not fair. It's not right. And the latest polls I've seen say two-thirds or more of the Greek people support uh, what Syriza is doing. But again, you've got the elites uh, led by Merkel and, and, and the, the other, uh, some of the other foreign ministers and, and, and premier, uh, uh, prime ministers and so on saying that, no, we can't let Greece be an example. And I'll just close by talking about when the United States conducted its terrorist war against Nicaragua in the 1980s. Oxfam explained that, that, that Nicaragua, which brought in land reform, rights for women, rights for aboriginal people, free health care, free education, was the threat of a good example. Because what if other countries said, our government should work for our people as opposed to foreign elites and multinationals? And I would argue the same threat is, is, uh, is seen in Syriza. If they actually win uh, around for the Greek people. Other people in the Mediterranean, in Ireland, and around the world will say, look, it works. And the last thing elites want is the people of the world to unite. And that cheerful note, thank you very much. <laughs>